Welcome to this week's episode of Future Fridays, where we chat about future tech headlines from the week. I'm your host, Wiz, and you can find me on Twitter at WizLikeWizard. Today, we've got three lovely guests. we will have each go around and give a short 280 character intro. And we also have Yell, who's a cartoonist who'll be live doodling with us for fun. And you can find her on Instagram at Yellisms. So Colin, we'll start with you if you want to just give a short 280 character introduction of yourself. Yeah, of course. Uh, my name is Colin Borns. I'm an associate with Voice Punch, and we're an early stage venture fund that has a thematic focus in audio, voice, and conversational tech. Awesome. Kate, you want to go next? Sure thing. I am Kate Murdoch. I'm an associate at OpenView Venture Partners, where we focus on B2B software at what we call the expansion stage. Uh, so roughly Series A through Series C. Cool. And last but not least, Sarah. Hey, I'm Sarah Talamash, and I'm a stand-up comic, and I travel, well, I used to travel, but now I just do Zoom shows, <laughs> and I like tech. <laughs> and comedy shows in parking lots in New York now, right? Standing yeah. up on pickup trucks? <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. All right, before we jump in, I just want to say that all the headlines we're going to talk about today come from a newsletter I work on called This Week in Creative Tech. Each week, we share 30 different headlines from the week that are on interesting future techie type stuff. For those of you watching, you can sign up at bit.ly slash join Future Fridays. So we're going to kick today off with a really fun game. This is called Real or Fake. So we've got three headlines here, two of which are real and one of which is fake. The job for all of you is to guess which one is fake. So I'm going to read them out and then we'll do a rock, paper, scissors style game to, so that you can show um, which one you think is fake. This round is going to be worth five points. I'm going to keep track of points, and there's going to be a really awesome prize at the end for the winner. So first one here is this AI makes up words you won't even find in the dictionary. Second one is engineer creates deep fake of boss and announces three-day weekend for the company. <laughs> and the third one is this robotic basketball hoop makes any klutz shoot like Michael Jordan. So. Again, your job is to guess which one is fake. So we'll do hands up and we'll do rock, paper, scissors, shoot, and then just show one to three, which one you think is fake and leave it up. So rock, paper, scissors, shoot. So we've got Ooh. three, two, one. All right, so the fake. fake headline is in fact the second one. Uh, engineer creates deep fake of boss and announces three day weekend for company. So Colin, that's five points for you to kick things off. Um, nice. This actually sounds like something from The Office. I remember when Jim reset Michael's clock and uh, woke him up from a nap and everyone went home early. <laughs> I feel like that one's incredibly believable. <laughs> it sounds yeah. pretty good. All right, so we'll jump into the first headline today. Uh, forget exercise, these mice got ripped with gene therapy. So this headline is based on a study that was done by the Washington University Medical School in which a bunch of mice received gene therapy that led them to quickly build muscle mass and reduce obesity, even while they were eating a diet high in fat and not exercising. So the study targeted a specific gene called FST, which is responsible for making a protein called folostatin. And that's a protein that's responsible for the growth of muscle and controlling metabolism. What they found is that after four months, the mice in the study more than doubled their muscle mass and their strength levels. They also had reduced damage from osteoarthritis, less joint inflammation, and had healthier hearts and blood vessels than mice that didn't receive gene therapy. I mean, honestly, sounds pretty amazing to me. Um, if and when this therapy is ever available to humans, it won't be for all of us to get jacked. It will be for treating serious conditions like muscular dystrophy or severe obesity. Um, so question to you all to kick off the conversation today. If we do get to a place in the future where we can edit human DNA, genes to deliver desirable characteristics, things like muscle mass, even eye color, aptitude for math, et cetera, should we and where should we draw the line? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll start if you want. Um, but I, you know, I think I, I come from like, the, from like a high level perspective of just giving people like full bodily autonomy, whether that's they wanna Get a different hair color, eye color, or smarts, whatever it may be. Um, I feel like it gets tricky if you start to tell people what they can and can't do, like with their bodies, you know. Um, so I think that that's interesting. But I also think we 
be like get into a dangerous space when you like try and draw the line on like scientific discovery right like um because you mentioned like the, the actual applications of this it's not like we're necessarily going to be able to go buy the like the, the magic pill that's going to let us sit around on the on the couch all day um but however i think like it is really interesting for the people that might really have a benefit from it. So like, I don't want to be the person that's going to say, um, Oh yeah, there might be this edge case of the future where this guy might look a lot better than me and have bigger muscles. But, um, I don't want, I don't want that to stop from people getting like proper care and things of that nature. Yeah. For me, I think if we're talking about, uh, you know, pre birth, um, you know, choosing, for example, what your child might look like, um, I, I am fall into the camp of I'm game for it if it's relative to the health of a child. Um, for example, if you know you have certain conditions um, that the child might have, um, I think it gets a lot trickier when you start trying to decide what features um, someone should have, right? Um, or, or what they might look like uh, in the future. I think that's where I probably fall in the camp of not so much. Why not so much? Um, because I think that maybe this is my like mentality, just old school mentality to a certain extent in that realm. But I think there's a certain magic personally to like creating a being and having that being be their own person um, and not having a say in what that being will look like. For example, like I think to a certain extent, if you're, I mean, I'm not a parent, so, you know, but I think to a certain extent, if you're a parent, at some point you should let your child like become the person that they wanna be. And if you start manipulating who they're going to become before they're even born, I feel like maybe that's not such good parenting. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I, I'm like intrigued to see where this goes, like, I mean, I feel like you get really out of hand. I also feel like mice getting jacked up is a really good premise for like a comic book movie. Um, it's very, uh -huh. uh, whatever, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. But it is, it's like weird. Um, I also feel like we'll start looking alike because people do it with plastic surgery anyway. Like you just notice a lot of like influencers kind of look, start looking very similar to each other. So, and then also beauty trends they're trends like you know for a while it was all about tits and now it's ass so i just feel like it's a it's such a weird place to go but i'm with colin on this one like you, it's hard to tell people what to do with their bodies but it's also a really weird experiment meaning i'm i am a believer it's like you're born it's kind of cool to be born the way that you are without having a choice <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And to add like to the, um, like the point with pre-birth, um, I feel like there's gotta be, it's so hard, but there's maybe like a handful of things like we would agree on. Um, like if a baby would be born like with like a severe disadvantage, like maybe it's a heart condition or like there's certain things, you know, obviously you're not going to want to like wish that upon a little, a little baby. And if you have the means to adjust that, like by all means, yeah. Um, but if you're going to like change the, like, I don't know, maybe like if you, if there'd some way be like a, a, a personality thing or something like along those lines. Um, yeah. Like there's something great about just letting a person become the person they want to become and you shouldn't have too much control over that. So it's, that is, it's tricky. If you're messing with anything post-birth, everyone do what you want. Yeah. Post-birth, all good. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, what's interesting is that this type of gene therapy would be applicable like post birth, yeah. like it yeah. applies to existing genes that are regulating parts of your body today. It's interesting to think about different trends. It seems like, especially with appearance based trends, you sort of get everyone coalescing around like the same trend. And then there's a swing back of the pendulum to more individuality. Do you guys see a world where people modify themselves to be like, tall, well for men, tall, strong men with a blonde hair and blue eyes and you end up with like, this large cohort of the population, but then everyone's like, wait, we don't actually want that. And then returns to like weird individuality or like, what do you think that looks like in the future? I, I, I personally think, I think it goes like everyone sort of converges into one thing for a little while until everyone starts getting bored of being the same. I don't know, I think of like the straight hair trend when I was in, at least when I was in middle school, everyone like straightening their hair to death and then all of a sudden curly girls being like, wait, 
no, I have cool hair, you know? And I feel like it's the same vibe. Like everyone becomes the same person. They're like, actually, you know what? I don't want to be like my next door neighbor. Instead, I want to do something different. And all of a sudden people start doing really quirky things um, to just have some sort of form of like expression of creativity. Yeah, I think if there was just like essentially full access, like there's no pricing, um, things that like will keep certain people out or, or like, like the things that come with supply and demand, like, yeah, of course, like we've already seen it with social media. Um, like you have like pulling at the extreme. So I think you'll have people going to those extremes too. Um, from like, I mean, it's, it's kind of like sad, you know, um, how much influence it actually does have on people and how like they adopt that into like themselves. Um, kind of, uh, but yeah, I think you would for sure see that. But I, I think that, um, when you think of, uh, the fact that if, you, if you could really have like somebody all of a sudden get muscles from a pill, like that's probably gonna be pretty expensive. So maybe not everybody's going to have that access. It makes sense. All right, we'll move on to our first cartoon of the day. Uh, cartoonist, do you have something funny for this one? Yeah, I didn't get as far as I would like. I had a lot of <laughs> ideas from what you guys were saying, but um, here we go. Can you guys see my screen? <laughs> oh. Actually, the second gene was missing there. There we go. <laughs> uh, gene therapy. Then we have uh, some. Quick... That's good. <laughs> um, what else? And then the last one is the kind of what Sarah was saying: the the mouse getting ripped. <laughs> What is, it, what is he, what is he, oh, the puzzle? Like the, yeah, he's the just like <laughs> looking at the whole cheese puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, the last one that I was trying to work on was also what Sarah was saying and draw like a baby with a giant butt and then parents being like, <laughs> oh, we shouldn't have picked this trend. <laughs> so nice. That's all I got. Awesome. That's Thank good. You. All right, we will move on to the next headline. So this one is, it's a concept called Smart Move. The mobile retail kiosk is multifunctional. Uh, so this one is about a conceptual project looking to transform how we buy and sell products and services. The idea is that rental space and the staff to rent them are expensive. Uh, this is an autonomous retail robot that provides a mobile solution to address those two things. So not having to rent a space by being able to just drive your rental space wherever you want and pack up shop as needed. And also not having to staff it because everything here is autonomous. Uh, it can be used in both urban and rural areas and will make it easier for businesses to launch and help them reach their target audiences no matter how big or small the town is. I texted this to a friend earlier and I basically said this is like the future of uh, vending machines. Um, question to you all. Will the future of retail be void of human interaction? And is this something that we'll miss? Uh, we had the CEO of Ono on a few weeks ago and they're building autonomous food trucks. So they've got these in Los Angeles. Today they're doing smoothies. So it's like, you can imagine like a food truck that's not manned that you can go up to and like get a smoothie made and it just like auto produces your smoothie for you. So it's kind of like a riff on that. Um, what do you all think? I think it makes sense. It just feels like a lot of, I know a lot of retail, my sister had a retail store in Dallas and the rent was so much and that it was just really hard to run. And I know there's another jewelry business, I think Erica Wiener, she just stopped her store and went online and now is just doing pop-up shops. So I feel like this will become the future of retail. Um, I don't know if I miss human contact in retail. I think in hotels, like I could do with more kiosks and hotels yeah i i kind of have a different I, I don't know i think like there's there's definitely like this trend towards um i guess like the things that is that can be automated um like it's better if we have uh ai and you know robots that might help us in, in doing some of those tests that that there's a lot of turnover already with like the jobs that that people are um like do, the people that are doing those jobs in the first place however i think um I would say no, that like there isn't going to just be void of, of human interaction. I, I don't know about you guys, but like this whole pandemic, I was already working remote, but um, 
like <laughs> this thing has been a whole different thing. Like I've just been like needing <laughs> any sort of human interaction. I think in, in retail specifically we're, or in other areas as well, we're just going to start to see that shift of like those jobs that are highly mundane or can easily be handled by technology. Like we're going to still see that shift start to happen, maybe more accelerated now. Um, but I still think that there's a need um, for humans and in, in different things. And I think there's going to be a need for humans in retail as well, whether that's more personalized decisions, whether that's still in an online setting, maybe it's not physical brick and mortar. Um, but I, I still think there's going to be a need for, for human interaction in, in like the general retail setting. Yeah, I mean, I think of it in a similar way. Um, I think much like we're seeing in the rest of uh, the world, and I, I see it a lot, and I think we're seeing it a lot in B2B software even, which is um, more and more we're automating away what is um, sort of standard or can be in software. I mean, even in like code to a certain extent, templatized, um, and then letting people focus on the things that are creative. And I think we'll see the same thing to a certain extent in the retail world, which is maybe more, a lot more stores will move to e-com. Um, I don't think that will be completely void of in-person experiences, but I think that we'll move towards more experiences rather than yeah. like general shops. You'll have people who are still doing retail-based work, but it'll be a lot more of like creative high level necessarily, uh, more so than what it is um, maybe today. And then you'll have a lot more automation in like checkout processes and security. And um, you'll find, I think maybe in more like, expensive shopping that you'll still have like hands on people who do a lot of work with you, but maybe not in like general retail. Um, and that will shift as people take on different types of roles. Yeah. I think experiential is a good word. Like it's just gonna become a lot more experiential versus just like the huge massive stores where you can go and find anything. Like, why would you go find anything in there? Um, like, and now people are getting kind of walked in like, how can I shop online? Like these companies are forced to, um, help, like, I guess all their different users do that. So I think, um, we're going to see an acceleration towards, um, like was mentioned, just that more experiential experience across the board. Yeah, I think building on what Sarah was saying, there is sort of like those use cases for me as well, in which like I don't want to talk to a human. So like hotel check-ins for sure. Uh, car rentals, right? Because then you're not like upselling on all the insurance and like refilling the tank and everything. Uh, grocery stores, sometimes I want to like check out manually, depending on what's going on in my card. Um Food is a tough one though. Like there's some restaurants that I've been to that I don't mind ordering from like a kiosk and then picking up the food. But I remember when I lived in San Francisco, they had this one restaurant in Soma that uh, there was like no humans. You ordered from a kiosk and then there was like a wall of windows that opened and it's just like, you go to like window 29 and like you open this window and like your lunch is there. And it just like, it felt kind of weird. And like, I don't know, I guess question to you guys there is, is it just that we're not there yet and it's something that people will get comfortable with and then for things like food, like especially like lunch where it's quick and you just want to grab something that will get used to just like opening the slot and picking it up or are those, are there those industries where we always will want that human touch even when it's more of a transactional situation? Kate, I saw you shaking your head. We have a spot here um, and I'm totally blanking on the name of it right now, but um, we have a spot here where I believe that there are people in the kitchen who do do some work, but it's almost entirely like robots. So you literally watch this robot, like put your food together and then it's delivered to you. I personally am, I kind of stick by my original comment of experiential. I, to me, like going out and eating food is an experience that I crave. And I would hate to see a world in which I didn't have like human interaction in that. Like I love the experience of being I don't know, of having like incredibly creative chefs build food that's phenomenal and like getting to interact with someone who knows a lot about that food, knows a lot about the wine. Like to me, that's a beautiful experience that I would hate to see go away. Other yeah, things, though, I'm all about it. <laughs> it feels Hotel like there's chickens. room for both, I feel yeah. like. Because sometimes you want to just grab and go and you don't need to have an experience, but definitely like restaurants, I mean, it is a social thing in, you know, talking to the waiter who can make a good suggestion or let you know what's fresh for today. And it's just weird to, to go to a restaurant for that experience and then you know that it's just robots making your food. <laughs> yeah. I, I think also like with a lot of things, um, you have like both ends of the extreme. So there could be like a real, like 
it's hard to operate in the middle, I guess. So things that can be done quick, the fast foods and whatnot, I feel like you're going to have that quick, um, not have to maybe talk to a human, that sort of experience. But then it's like the dining um, where you do want that sort of like here in Chicago, a linear um, sort of experience. Uh, you're not going to want that done by a bunch of robots or automation. Like that is, that just can't be replaced. No. 100%. All right. We'll move on to the second game. So this one is multiple choice and this is worth 10 points. So Colin and Sarah, a chance for you to take the lead. Uh, so we've got a headline here with a missing blank and then three <laughs> options, two of which are fake and one of which is real. Your job is to write down which of these is the correct answer that completes this headline. Um, so the headline is, forget sewing your own mask. Now you can grow one from bacteria, sea sponge, or tomatoes. Uh, just write down your answer, and then when everyone's ready, give me a thumbs up, and then we'll have everyone show their answers to the screen. I feel like I'm hoping on this one. <laughs> good. All right, good, yeah. Okay. Uh, sh show your answers to the screen. Show your answers? Yeah. B. Oh. Oh. B. C sponge. C sponge. Everybody said C sponge? C sponge all around. Are we all wrong? I just feel natural. I don't, th yeah, I don't think we want good. the other ones to be the case. <laughs> I knew it was going to be bacteria. Oh my God. Right? Oh, I yeah. saw an article this week all about mushrooms and what you can build, do with mushrooms, which is incredible. And it made me think of sea sponge. That's why. I, I think I saw this on your Twitter and now, like, now I'm remembering this tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the correct answer was bacteria. Uh, so, I mean, this, this, again, this is just like a conceptual prototype of a mask. Um, this was two designers from a studio called Some Studio that came up with a prototype of this called the Zillinum mask. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Um, but basically, it's made from bacterial cellulose. Um, and what's interesting about it is you can grow this at home. All you need is water, tea, sugar, and a small bacterial sample. And you can actually, they say that like this, this Zillinum uh bacterium is the same one that's using kombucha so if you had unflavored kombucha you could make this mask mask at home it basically forms like a thin sheet of like cellulose some like material and then you can like very attractively stick it to your face does it filter <laughs> so how does that work with heat <laughs> it does uh what's interesting is one of the big reasons of the shortages for the n95 masks now is that the filter is polymer based um, and that's the thing that's like hard to produce. This does a similar job of filtering. And one of the benefits is it can be thrown away at single use and it can be composted. Um, so maybe if quarantine lasts much longer than any of us hope, we'll be growing our own masks out of our kombucha. <laughs> it looks <Yeah>. gross. <laughs> yeah, it looks, it looks I, disgusting. I found a kombucha in the back of my fridge the other day, so it might have a head start. <laughs> Yeah, g give it a, give it a shot. Give us a, give it a shot and let us know how it goes. Um, great. This next headline is spatial. Collaborate with lifelike avatars in VR, AR, web. So spatial is a new company that's creating a new 3D type of collaborative video chat in VR and AR that uses lifelike avatars. So users can collaborate in virtual meetings using images, videos, and 3D models. What's interesting about this is instead of using cartoony avatars like we're used to today in a lot of VR uh, environments, users appear more like holograms with real faces, um, including motion sensors that track your head and hand movements and even lip motions that are key to their voices. Spatial Web works with um, a number of different headsets, uh, including the Oculus Quest, which is also interesting where previously these type of holographic experiences were only available in sort of like multi-thousand dollar headsets like the Microsoft One uh, or the Magic Leap. Um, so question to you all to kick things off, is AR VR virtual conferencing the future of work and collaboration? Do the benefits of it outweigh the disadvantages? Uh, what are the thoughts there? Okay, so I may, as the software investor here, be behind the times, but uh, at least my experience with quarantine, and we worked all over the place before this, is that the, like, the prime productivity comes from not sitting next to people. Like, 
literally being in a space with other people, even if it's virtual, would isn't distracting to me. And so I personally am, I think AR, VR could be really cool for certain aspects of collaboration, but as like a place where you, like a virtual office where you spend all of your day there and kind of like bump in and out based on what you have for meetings, like to me, that's a recipe for less productivity, um, at least for the way I work. And so I don't know if we'll see like full, at least my opinion is we probably won't see full virtual like offices where you're spending your entire time and like in a, in a virtual room together. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there might be some edge cases where it might make sense. Um, but I, I think that like, I for sure have the whole Zoom fatigue thing, right? But <laughs> I think that there's a lot of like other better um, or like alternative solutions, whether it be like Loom or Yak Chat, for example, um, that have like an interesting, like it's, a, it's an alternative to like sitting down and having that Zoom meeting. But I think it gets to like a similar end point, just like an alternative to, I guess, like a conference call in the first place. I think that's more interesting rather than um, trying to, I guess, recreate um, like what we know as like a conference call. Um, like think of like where conference calls of the future may be more efficient and, and better um, rather than just saying, okay, we know like what sitting around a board table, boardroom table is like, let's just put that into AR, VR. That said, there could be some really cool use cases, especially if you're working on physical products yeah. or something like if you're working on hardware or anything like that, um, where if you're in a virtual co like collaborative experience together, you could actually work on something that's in theory physical without having to actually be physically with the item or not having everyone be physically with the item. And to me, that's like, that could be completely revolutionary in terms of how we hire talent around the world. If we could all work on something physical together, but from all over the place without having to relocate, that's really pretty incredible. Um, I see it less for me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I worked in offices briefly and I feel like uh, the annoying part was, um, I don't like going to commute and especially if there's something I can do at home. So I like the idea of a virtual meeting, but I, I agree like if this is, I wouldn't like being in a virtual office all day. Like that sounds, I mean, I, ha I have four, four Zoom meetings today and it just feels annoying that I have to yell at my computer four times today. So <laughs> I don't enjoy that, but I, I definitely see, like I thought it would be cool to do like a virtual dance club. <laughs> I would Thank join you. your virtual dance club for sure. Right? <laughs> you have your, your friends that are in another state or another country just be like, hey, meet me. And you get a DJ and you get to listen to your music and dance at home, but also go. hang out with your friends at the same time. Totally. Would totally yeah. do. I mean, unless you're work. having some sort of cocktail party <laughs> here in the, the promo image that I use. I don't know if this is like yeah. a short <laughs> right? happy hour or what. There's a lot going on uh, in the image. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> To be fair to them, the other images that I looked on their website um, were Kate, more of the type of use cases that you spoke to. I think for like your typical run of the mill meeting, getting everyone to yeah. like put on a headset, like dial in and like be there in like holographic form is probably more than is needed. But they're probably like if you're doing like a design sprint and you want to like look at certain elements, especially if they are like 3D elements and you're doing product, that's kind of cool, but it feels super edgy i mean i don't know how you build a like a big business on something that people use sporadically and only some companies use unless sarah's um yeah, zoom <laughs> zoom zoom dance parties take off I mean, there, there's something <laughs> interesting there <laughs> we'll say it would also be another really cool use case for it potentially um i mean maybe this is less relevant when the world eventually opens back up but um for virtual conferences when having breakout rooms or having like small small sessions um, being able to actually physically be in a space with people, I think is part of what makes a, a conference really exciting. And so um, for those kinds of events, it could be quite cool to do something like that. Um, but yeah. I and, suspect that we're going to want to get back to in-person conferences as soon as possible, right? We're all missing that human interaction. And the free cocktails. Yes, <laughs> yes. And lukewarm coffee. Um, <laughs> great, we'll move on. Uh, cartoonist, you got something funny for us? Yeah. Nice. There we go. Can you guys see that? 
I kind of just imagined our team doing that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I repurposed that little guy for a really mean coworker. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then lastly, I just my first thought goes to <laughs> not paying attention. <laughs> Using your powers for good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, awesome. Thank you. All right, so we'll move on to the last game of the day. This is fill in the blank. This is worth 10 points. So Kate and Sarah, this is your chance to beat Colin out um, or Colin, your chance to win handily. So we've got a future tech headline here with a blank. The job to all of you is to come up with what you think the real answer is to complete this headline. So 10 points for the right answer or five points for anything outrageously funny. If you don't know what it is and you can tie with Colin, um, so go ahead, just give me the thumbs up when you're ready and we'll show our answers to the screen again. <laughs> I have no idea, so I think mine might be a joke one. <laughs> yeah, mine. Yeah. I, wish yeah, I, are good. I have no idea, but I'm also not funny, so. I was going to say, I can't try and com <laughs> compete with a comedian right now. That's <laughs> too quick. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's see what, uh, let's see what you guys got. Show it to the screen. Something backwards. Oh, yeah. Oh, Mine yeah. Does jump it say the jump shark. the shark? This tool will tell you when a TV series starts to jump the shark. Mine says get good, but I wrote get it good. in the wrong direction. Mine says get boring, so call me wrong. <laughs> say we're on the same, same path. <laughs> uh, so the correct answer is suck. Uh, <laughs> this tool will tell you when a TV series starts to suck. Kate, you were pretty close, so I'll give you five points, which means that you tie with Colin. You both will get a prize. I'll email you after the show for that. <laughs> um, yeah, this is about a fun little tool that a developer named Benjamin Mizrahi came up with um, that has basically scraped all of the IMDb ratings for TV shows and then plots it into a graph that shows you when TV shows start to fall off. So the idea is that you can decide before you jump into a series uh, whether you want to invest your time into it or not. Like that. Um, awesome. So for everyone watching, this is where you can find everyone online. And then finally, one last time, all the headlines from this week came from This Week in Creative Technology. Feel free to sign up at bit.ly slash join Future Fridays. Um, thank you so much, guys. That was really awesome. Yeah, thank you. For having it was us. a blast. Bye. Thank you.